Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joining us from different time zones around the world. My name is Kathy Teo, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm speaking to you from Singapore, where I'm based. I'm very proud to be representing Outright Action International in the capacity of board member and to be opening Outright's first event of the Pride 2021 season. This event is hosted by Outright and the Partnership for Global LGBTI Equality, PGLE. On behalf of Outright and PGLE, a very warm welcome to one and all who are here with us today. Before we commence, just a bit of housekeeping. So firstly, this webinar is being recorded, but only our speakers are on the screen. There will be a Q&A at the start, at the end rather. Uh, so do place your questions um, into the Q&A function. Our outright staff will also be using the chat function to share important resources throughout the program. So please keep an eye out for that. We invite you to introduce yourself using the chat function, including your name, preferred pronouns, where you're joining us from and your institutional affiliation. I'd like to quickly introduce our co-hosts who have brought us together today. First off, Outright. Outright Action International was founded in 1990 and works at a global, regional, and national level to eradicate the persecution, inequality, and violence that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and queer people face around the world. Outright builds capacity of LGBTIQ movements, documents human rights violations, advocates for inclusion and equality, and holds leaders accountable for protecting the rights of LGBTIQ people everywhere. Outright has recognized consultative status at the United Nations and is a founding member of the Partnership for Global LGBTI Equality. Our second host is the Partnership for Global LGBTI Equality, or PGLE, which is an initiative of BSR, the United Nations Human Rights, and the World Economic Forum and is a coalition of organizations that are committed to leveraging individual and collective advocacy to accelerate LGBTI equality and inclusion globally and, and to drive positive change. We're gathered here today, the 1st of June, as we commemorate and kick off Pride 2021. As history reminds us, the LGBT movement has emerged out of protest, struggle, and resilience. LGBT pride is both a resistance to oppression and the promotion of self-affirmation, dignity, equality, and visibility. This June 1st, we are faced with the grim statistic that there have been over 3.5 million lives that have been lost globally to the COVID-19 pandemic just in the last year and a half. In our lifetime, there has been no other crisis like this that has devastated so many countries around the world. Hardly any corner of the world is spared from the humanitarian and the economic impact of the COVID-19 crisis. The most marginalized LGBTIQ people, along with other vulnerable segments of society, have been hit the hardest, including experiencing food and income insecurity, inadequate access to PPE, vaccines, and culturally competent healthcare, social isolation, scapegoating, and violence. Please join me as we'd like to hold a moment of silence to remember and honor the lives that have been lost in this past year to the pandemic, to violence and other causes. Thank you for that. This COVID-19 pandemic has both laid bare systemic fragilities in the protection of basic rights and precipitated human rights crisis around the world, including for LGBTIQ people. 
In many places, LGBTIQ human rights are not factored in as a component of pandemic emergency response or in post-pandemic recovery, leading to a deepening humanitarian crisis for queer people everywhere. In some places, the pandemic has been used to further curtail the rights and well-being of LGBTIQ people, including the restriction of free speech, movement and assembly, inequitable access to emergency and humanitarian aid, and development of new discriminatory policies. So for this reason, Outright published Vulnerability Amplified, which is a global research report on the impact of COVID on LGBTIQ people with recommendations from multi-sector actors on how to respond inclusively. In addition, Outright also established the COVID-19 Global LGBTIQ Emergency Fund, which is, the, which is the first and the largest LGBTIQ serving pandemic emergency fund of its kind globally, which PGLE and many of its members have strongly supported, including the companies that are represented on our panel today, namely Microsoft, PepsiCo, and Procter & Gamble. However, much more needs to be, needs to be done much more can be done. As we celebrate the launch of Pride Month today, we remember that since its inception, the LGBTIQ movement has risen out of strength and out of resilience. Today is no different. In this unprecedented time, there is an urgency for all sectors, all our allies to come together. So we're so glad to have all of you here today with us in unity and in allyship. And for today's event, we have assembled a wonderful panel of speakers as we explore how the the private sector can partner with civil society to act as a force for good and to advocate either individually or in unison to advance LGBTIQ equality globally. With that, I'm pleased to bring on Luzerne McAllister, Director of Global Diversity and Inclusion at, as, at PepsiCo as moderator for our panel discussion. Here's wishing all of you a very happy pride. Stay safe, stay strong. Over to you, Luzerne. Thank you, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope everyone is having a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, and of course, happy Pride to everyone. Um, I want to say a special thank you and welcome to my fellow panelists and give them a quick introduction um, right now. So joining us, we have Claire Ayeri, um, Associate General Counsel of Procter & Gamble. We have Michael Karimian, Senior Manager, Human Rights from Microsoft. Kanita Placide, um, Co-Founder, Executive Director of Eastern Caribbean Alliance Diversity and Equality. Mel Melisanda Shifter, from, uh, who is a Project Lead in Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for World Economic Forum. And of course, Michael Van Gelderen, Human Rights Officer um, of the Office of the United Nations um, High Commissioner for Human Rights. So I wanna thank all you all for joining me today. Um, and just to get us started in this at this stage, um, really at this time, we have just been through so much change globally around the world. Um, and prior to this past year, um, we were in a moment of consistent effort, pushing and pulling to help bring about global inclusion of the LGBT community. Um, and we have seen so many um, around the world who live in various LGBT communities live very much um, in the marginalized, um, on the marginalized area of their, of their communities, of their society, of politics, um, really fighting every day for their basic human rights. Then the pandemic hit. And that really turned up the heat on everyone, especially those who were marginalized, um, especially those who were already living on the razor's edge of marginalization of their societies. And as we started to put our heads around what we could do and really start to think, we realized that while there's so much we can do in, in, in you know, at the moment in terms of donations, in terms of food, now we're at a point where even with um, vaccines coming out, even with uh, kind of more and more people realizing that there are marginalized communities out there, we see not only that our communities um, and the LGBT communities around the world are still struggling, still need help, um, but are also facing unique 
um, are facing unique challenges, um, not only due to the pandemic, but due to reaction of the pandemic and what has happened since. And so what we're here to do today on this panel is not just talk about that, but talk about how we can start to solve for that, how we can start to come together collectively and build um, and build solutions towards inclusion and voice um, and, and really um, helping create a better world for those who are belong to communities, to the LGBTIQ communities around the world. And so I'm excited to start this panel. We're gonna kind of move through um, talking about um, kind of the United Nations viewpoint. We're gonna talk about civil society's role as well as how both of those uh, work with the corporate community. Um, and we're gonna talk about how we can collectively bring our voice together to bring about that change. So without further ado, I am going to jump into question one. And the first question is from where you sit, and this is really kind of geared towards Michael Van Gelderon from the United Nations. So from Michael, from where you sit, what do you perceive as the biggest global challenge to ensuring that LGBTIQ people um, are not left behind as a result of this crisis? And what is the strategic next step that corporations can now take to support this? Thank you, thank you, Lizard, and, and thank you to Outright and, and CGV for putting on this event and to all the participants for connecting. It's really great to be here. Um, so <laughs> Lizard, you ask a small question, you know, how, how can- Really we quickly, sorry to interrupt, Michael. Is there a way you can be a little closer to the microphone? Okay, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're gonna to have to put it very close. <laughs> okay. And okay. speak loudly. Okay, okay, I will do that. Okay, is that okay now? Much better. Okay, perfect. No, so thank you, Luzerne and uh, and Outright and TGD for the event. It's great to be here. Um, so, you know, I think that the, um, and, and Kathy already, and, and yourself already referred to it, but I think what we've seen is really this disproportionate impact, no? how, the, how the pandemic has really magnified the marginalization and the exclusion that LGBTIQ people face. Um, and how, you know, when LGBTIQ plus people uh, want to access public social safety schemes and shelters, you know, we've seen the reports of domestic violence and increases in homelessness, um, they often face exclusion. And so they rely on the LGBTIQ organizations, you know, local organizations for support. But these organizations have in turn been really hard hit by the pandemic. And then at the same time, we've seen in the midst of this pandemic, uh, which has really affected everyone, but really hit the community really hard, we've actually seen an increase in hateful narratives, for example, against trans people. And so there have been, you know, um, attempts and, and some successful and, and some are still, uh, are still um, you know, are, are ongoing to try to restrict or deny the fundamental rights of, of trans people. So further excluding, so not only do you have the, the hit of the pandemic, you also have these, these really uh, harmful uh, efforts to further exclude uh, trans people. And then you have the broader context where we still have a criminalization of same-sex relations and often of trans people in you know, a, around a third of the countries around the world, which is a further context that, that provides, uh, you know, uh, that creates a huge challenge to, to address the impact of the pandemic. I think you know, there's an opportunity in a sense that there is a realization that inequality and discrimination have allowed the pandemic to have such a heavy and significant impact on society is that unless you know, every member of society is included, including LGBTIQ plus people, you know, we won't be able to address the impact of this pandemic, uh, let alone, you know, um, uh, move forward um, with the sustainable development goals or prevent the impact of a future pandemic. And I think, you know, the, the corporate sector has such a, a critical role to play. I mean, first of all, you know, being able to provide support uh, to LGBTIQ civil society organizations in the countries where they operate. But I think also partnering with civil society to counter these hateful narratives uh, against LGBTIQ plus people and particularly against the trans community, which has really seen the, the brunt of, of, of the hate in, in, in recent times. And then finally, it's, you know, companies have influence on engaging with governments and can advocate for social protection systems that are really inclusive and accessible for all LGBTIQ plus people. 
So I think for me, you know, those are three areas where co uh, where companies can really make a difference in in uh, in this in this pandemic to um, uh, help LGBTQ plus people to to bounce back and recover, but also in setting the seeds for you know um, um, a better future where it, you know um, when the next waves of the pandemic hits, there are better systems in place where. Um, LGBTQ plus people have access to to protection and support um, on an equal basis with everyone else. Thank you for that perspective, and and absolutely, we're we're seeing so much. You know, not just kind of reaction to the crisis in terms of maybe natural kind of food insecurity and job insecurity, and there's certainly those who work kind of disproportionately in these, some of these communities in sex work and therefore have really been impacted by kind of quarantine and, and you know, orders to stay home, things like that, or, or curfews. Um, but then you have this narrative, right? You have this additional narrative coming from different kind of maybe political spheres, policy spheres, um, really pushing people even further to the margins, almost scapegoating them um, for this crisis. Um, in many cases. And so um, absolutely the, you know, corporate's ability to kind of help build that voice um, and really work with various different local leaders, regional leaders, even country leaders um, to help rewrite that narrative um, is, an, is an amazing way to help uh, make one impact. Who else has um, some thoughts on this that they'd like to chime in um, in terms of really um, helping to create a better, more inclusive um, environment post-crisis. Hey, Lizanne, this is Claire from Procter & Gamble. I would just echo the comments um, that were previously said. And um, being from Procter and & Gamble in, in marketing, um, we think it's highly important to be accurate and portray LGBTQI people um, and what we found during COVID is in addition to what everyone said about pandemic having effects on fundraising events, on communities, um, we also saw that pride was being canceled. The events that everyone came together for were being, were being canceled. And we as a company wanting to be, continue that visibility of being so important. Um, we wanted to make sure that you couldn't cancel Pride. So we established the Can't Cancel Pride um, event to bring people together because, you know, Pride is a moment of visibility. Um, we know the power of voice and we have that privilege to provide that power of voice. And it's our obligation to do that as companies and to use that voice and that privilege for others who um, are marginalized. And, you know, the Can't Cancel Pride um, was seen as a way to help those impacted by fundraising. We raised over $4.1 million, I think last year, and the new Can't Cancel Pride is this Friday, 9 p.m. I'll give a better uh, example later, but um, I think it's just important that we use these opportunities to think outside the box as companies. Be creative, think about how do you connect with people each and every day if you cannot be there face-to-face. -face. And that's what we did as marketing companies is really try to push that, push the way that we could connect to the person if they were stuck in an area at home um, and would not, was not able to engage with their community. Um, so I, I just think it's critical for companies not to shy away at these times. This is where companies need to step up and do the most that they can do to really help support those who need the support um, the most. That's a really great comment. And since I know you work in kind of associate general counsel, I think sometimes those who, so those who work for companies and kind of those maybe even who sit in my position who very clearly want to um, make sure that our companies are using their, their name, their weight, if you will, their influence um, to really go out there and make a statement from someone who sits in on the legal team, what can people do? 
um, who are maybe not on the legal team, who are advocates maybe sitting on their ERG um, or working in diversity, equity, inclusion, how can they work with and partner with their legal team to kind of best figure out what is the best thing to do? What is the best course of action? What is the right thing to do? Especially in cases where we are on global teams or working for multinational corporations and may do business in countries that are not quite so LGBTQ plus friendly. How do we start to have those conversations with our legal teams? Yeah, that's good. I mean, I have always felt as being part of the legal community, it was my obligation to bring a voice to this because I think oftentimes people are concerned about the quote unquote legal issues they might face. And I feel like it's very similar to people when they say there's tax issues, you don't really know what's going on, but there's something that, that shouldn't happen. Um, and so what I would say of engaging, if you're in legal or you're not, start the conversation about what you're interested in doing. Start small, start simple. And that's what we did at p and I think uh, what we need to do from a legal standpoint is I wanted to make sure first and foremost that our employees were safe. That was very critical for me because we are an international company and there are a lot of countries that do have persecution laws. I had to ensure that they felt safe as well as building an inclusive environment within P&G. So it, we use the ILGA map. I, it's been updated year after year and it's amazing. And we actually have set up our internal um, affinity team, our, our internal um, LGBTI um, team using that map. So we would start our groups and you know, Europe was a better place to start than a few years back than the US if you looked at the ILGA map. So we had to create different ways of connecting. So in persecution countries, we might talk diversity inclusion, but then when they came to a place that wasn't persecution, we would provide more insights at that point. So I think it's all about making sure you are engaged with your legal counsel, making sure you try to keep your employees safe and know that small things start at one place and can expand. And the more the group thinks the right way, the more the laws will change. And if you've looked at the map from five years to now, things are moving in the right direction. And you know, if you have difficulties, I'll put this out with legal or have concerns about that, feel free to, to contact me. I'm more than happy to talk to other um, legal colleagues to kind of share my experience and how they can help support their team. Very good, thank you. Any last thoughts before we move on to the next question? Just wanted to open the floor, see if there were any other last thoughts on this topic. Uh, thank you so very much. I'll probably just say something quickly. I'm Kenita Placid, um, based in Sinusha. And as we notice, as we think about corporations and how they are able to um, do something more, take the next step, protect LGBT persons, is also ensuring that they step up on the human resource policies, um, the, the HR policies in terms of protections within the job spaces, and also looking at how they can support civil society, um, whether upfront or through back channels in terms of continuing work like this. And today definitely rings a bell in terms of thinking through the number of you who are um, connected to other organizations or corporations um, and corporations that are allowing you to actually be visible, who, um, who are allowing you to support organizations like Outright, who in turn um, support organizations like mine in the region. And so we actually look at how we play it forward because what you do actually have impact on regions that you don't even expect it to. So I think there are ways to step up definitely in terms of thinking human resource, financial resources, but also internal, internal policies ensuring protections, not just when you're in the US or not just when you're in the UK or in Canada, but as you have subsidy companies or branches in different regions also making sure those policies apply um, within the walls of the structures that you are operating out of. So even in different regions, you are still protecting LGBT persons on a daily basis. 
That's a great point. Thanks so much for that. So there's two things there, and one of them is going to be a great transition to the next question, Kanita. Um, so the first thing that you said was really about what's going on inside your walls, right? As you look to address what's going on outside of those walls, but you're working in those communities or you're delivering products in those communities or you have offices in those communities, make sure that your own house is in order. Make sure that you have the right policies and that you have workplace inclusion working well um, within kind of your own walls, which is an amazing thing. And I, I would say as a build on that, the other thing that can happen when a com one company does that, um, and we see Microsoft do such a great job of this, right, is that they start and then other companies and other, you know, other teams at other companies in those areas feel that they can also start to do it. They can also kind of, you can call it the bandwagon effect, but in this case, it's a good rainbow bandwagon. Um, and you kind of, you know, have the right people seeing, they can say, how did your company do this? How did your company do this? And start to kind of lift and shift that playbook for themselves and also start to build it. And next thing you know, you have a whole community of companies, of literal offices in locations that are now bringing about this change and then can collectively go and talk policy to other change makers in society. So that's really an important point. And thank you so much, Kanita. We are gonna stick with you as we talk a little bit more about civil society. And I know that you talked about how we can work with civil society a little bit. I'm gonna ask you to expand on that a little bit more, but also kind of give us your opinion on the state of the relationship today between corporations and civil societies as you see it. Where are things going well? Where are there opportunities to improve? And kind of what's the next phase? What's the next step in your mind? Well, we certainly understand. Thank you, thank you. I think that this is, I think what, I, what I'm always conscious of is how do you put things nicely without, you know, speak your mind, but still be cautious of your words. Um, and I think it's necessary for corporate to always have that open door um, to be able to communicate with civil society, um, have round tables, um, check ins, um, understand how you can actually play a greater role in different regions that look differently. Um, and I think what we would see is that I think in the Caribbean, for example, you know, I think every brand name that exists is here, but there's not much representative here. And so we actually would have to depend on an organization like Outright who has partners, partnered with us consistently um, to see when it's possible that we can actually come to the table and get the opportunity to speak um, with, uh, with corporate like you folks. Um, and I say that because more often than not, we think about where the bigger market is. And I know with this pandemic, everybody felt the heat of it, especially um, corporate who had to think about how they keep their products visible, how they keep marketing alive, how they maybe even sold anything at all. And I know a lot of small businesses which opened actually closed because they just could not deal with the financial burden in short, short spaces. But when we think about the giant corporations, which has been around for a while, I think we look at what is the LGBT movement? What is your position to the LGBT movement? Um, how inclusive are your policies? How inclusive um, is the work that you're doing? And then you look at the next point, because whilst we think about diversifying, we would talk about diversifying um, and inclusion in the same thing. But actually, a lot of corporations are using this very loosely now because they are becoming tokenistic in terms of, I have one, two, and therefore it's representative. No, you're not doing it. Let's just be clear. That's not how it's done. When we talk about diversifying, you talk about ensuring that there is equitable and equality processes of inclusion and diversifying. One, you look at LGBT, two, you look at racial, and you look at the other issues that are actually going to affect your company, but also that of the people who you consistently need to buy the products that you are producing or the services. 
And so I think when we look at where things are, a number of persons have jumped on the bandwagon of pride to say they support pride. But what is meaningful beyond pride is not seeing you. It's not meaningful. It's just meaningful at the time. So it, pride for us, which has been a struggle to say it's visibility, to say that we are here, say that for some of us in some of our countries, it's a matter of saying, don't kill us. You know, don't uh, discriminate, don't violate our rights. And for companies who just sit behind and look at it as a marketing strategy because they can put out a new line of products to get people going, but then beyond that, they don't really see or understand the impact of what they should be doing. Have more conversations. And the, the open door concept is always one of the first processes. Because if a company comes to the table that says, we need to make money, and at the very same level, say, do no harm, then we know that we having, we're starting to have the right conversation. We are having it because you're looking at how do you make money, but at the same time, how do you not further impair the people that you're trying to make money from, right? And when we look at what has happened over the years, we as civil society have had to call on one or two um, corporates who have either made statements, who have supported artists, or done things in ways that has been harmful. Um, and we have to admit some of them have been humble. They have come to the table willing, open um, to learn, to move forward, to do better. But we also know they have others who have not. So consistently civil society has to continuously doing the checks and balances of where corporations are and how do we work with them? When do we work with them? Could they be visible? Do they need to do it from the background? And all of those things. And as the um, persons in legal will probably tell you, every time they have to work with us, they also need to do the conflict of interest and make sure a number of checks and balances happen before that can happen in terms of a working relationship. And that's totally fine. Um, but how can we build a stronger partnership? How can we actually move forward on ensuring there is resilience in the movement? And I think this comes in a number of parts. It comes with not just funding, but opportunities. How do you raise the bar as an organization? And I think Michael could probably even bring in the standards that was developed by the UN and how long it took for a number of companies who we thought would have just jumped on um, to actually jump onto this conduct, which was just looking at how you can better yourself and your services. Um, and still a day like today, there are still many corporations which has not signed on, which is shameful. But I mean, it is something that actually set a bar. What we also have is different chambers of commerce um, around the, the different states around the world that's looking at how businesses continue to work together in the interest of businesses. How do we ensure that the LGBT factor also becomes part of these conversations? How do we also ensure the racial conversation is also part of these conversations? Because as we market, we are not just saying we are gonna to market to the United States. We're gonna look at where the black and brown people are. We're gonna look at where the Asians are. We're gonna look at where the white people are, which, which diverse group is bringing more money to the, corp, to, the, to, to the corporation. And that's almost the same thing in relation to how you think about LGBT persons and where they are situated. So I think that as we look at how we move forward with resilience, I am saying creating seats at the table, not just the survey up there, but using organizations like Outright to tap into round tables with activists around the world where you can get it directly from them. So create those moments, create those spaces that allow for honest, outright conversation without people feeling like they need to step around or you know like they're walking on on eggshells because they're gonna lose funding or they're gonna lose an opportunity with you no embrace it 
understand what's being said out there, how things are being said, and create those spaces that allows you to grow and move forward. But again, outright thank you for bringing this space, creating this space, um, because this is the spaces where we unpack and we actually build stronger structures and foundations in moving forward. All right. That was a whole prescription and I love it. And I'm just gonna do my very best to do some summary of what we just heard. So in case those who are working for companies out there and you kind of want to know what to do, where to start, Kanita just laid it out for us. Look inside out, what is your internal policies and how do they amplify and emanate outside? Definitely do your checks and balances. Understand how you are operating within those local communities. Are you doing the right thing as much as you say you're doing the right thing, right? Um, and then if as you engage with civil societies to help guide your way, do your checks and balances to make sure that there is consistency as well as um, you know, not, um, I guess, doing anything illegal or that's you know, counter to what you need to do it from a legal standpoint. Um, looking at intersectionality, understanding caste systems in general, understanding how race and, and, and other areas of, of marginalization interact with this community's level of marginalization, understand those impacts, what that means at a global level if you're a global company or with inside the confines of a, of a smaller regional local society. Um, and then lastly, um, really bring together the knowledge that these civil societies have such as Outright, such as ILGA, as we've talked about, um, as such as GLAD and HRC, all of which, those that I just named, have one something in common, which is, um, I'm, which is the PGLE. And so as we transition over to talking about that commonality, I'm gonna invite Melisandre to our discussion so that she can give us the answer. What do these civil societies all have in common with us here today? What an elegant segue, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what they all have in common is that they are part, together with a couple of other um, business constituents of our Partnership for Global LGBTI Equality, the initiative that was mentioned in the very beginning, and uh, of which the, the World Economic Forum is one of the driving forces behind uh, the organization I'm representing. Um, and I think some of the work we're doing in PGLE is, uh, and, and at the forum as well, is really building on what Kenita just said. And I, I really love that. Um, so, so thank you for your points, Kenita, because I think if we look at the last couple of months, particularly, what has become evident, and I mean, everyone keeps on saying it, but it is important to uh, repeat it, that uh, the pandemic has made visible the pre-existing systemic inequities that many different marginalized communities are facing, but particularly the LGBTI community is also facing. LGBTI people do not have a level playing field in our societies and particularly in our economies. And so, you know, if, if you're looking at data that outright is producing, that the human rights campaign is producing, different other institutions are producing uh, of the last few months, uh, you will see that, for example, LGBTI people have, uh, have been 30% more likely to have lost their jobs uh, than the general population, have been twice as likely to have suffered a pay cut, uh, and are generally socioeconomically uh, off worse. Why is that though? It's not it's not because COVID came out of the blue, it is because the right structures, uh, the right social safety nets, the right work protection have not existed for the community so far. So you have a higher percentage of LGBTI people in, unemploy, uh, in unemployment, in the informal labor economy, et cetera. And so these are things that um, business and government now from the on outset of the recovery have to look at. And, and I think from the forum, there are, there are certainly a couple of things that, that we're looking at to do that. But I kind of want to start with the first one, because I think I started to think about that more and more recently, that 
there is one piece it's almost like a cultural soft piece but i think first of all organizations and individuals may need to rethink their um relationship and hope and ideal of meritocracy and and i wonder if that in organizations is often standing in the way because when you confront the dominant group whatever that may be um that there is the possibility that some of the outcomes have been influenced by systemic inequalities, that's where it becomes uncomfortable and defensive, et cetera. But I think we have to recognize the point that I was making that there are sometimes even invisible dynamics that there's not an equal playing field for all. How can you recognize these things? That is true one thing, for example, the, the forum uh, likes to um, push forward a lot, which is data and insight and see understanding the landscape and, and the situation we're in. And then from that, to Kanita's point, you can build standards and enact non-discriminatory policies. Um, that's what you know, the UN has done uh, really with, uh, with the standards. It's to see what corporate social progress means for LGBTI people. Um, what goes beyond the legal uh, minimum requirements and what's really agency to advance these LGBTI rights in your workplace, but also beyond in the marketplace, in your value chain, in your community, right? Um, and so these are things we're looking at with PGLE as well. How do you operationalize and set these standards in your organization? And ultimately what that leads to um, is also greater visibility, greater representation of LGBTI people, uh, not only to provide them equitable pathways to, uh, to your organization, to the, uh, the economy, but also to yeah, have that greater visibility in society, in popular culture, in leadership, um, all those things that ultimately contribute to a more inclusive society, uh, to increase social acceptance, to to yeah, uh, greater public opinion and support to drive legislative equality policies as well. Um, so these are things we we at the forum see, um, you know, that that have been there before, but have become particularly important now uh, as we're as we're entering the recovery as well to see how can we how can we embed and hardwire. LGBTI uh, rights as human rights and LGBTI equality into, into uh, all the policies, all the frameworks and the full architecture that we're, that we're kind of setting and resetting now. Very good, thank you, Melly. And so as we think about this and a quick reminder that we have a Q&A session, let me do the housekeeping part. So I just wanna remind everyone, if you have questions, we will have a quick Q&A section at the end. Um, so as you take in all of this information and, and questions bubble up, feel free to put it in the Q&A section. We will hopefully get to it. Um, so one of the things that, that was brought up is really understanding and the data right, and getting the data to help us tell the story and get a deeper understanding of where inequality exists and then, you know, creating a pathway from there. We've certainly seen um, the UN do this in terms of the standard. You can see that in the creation of PGLE itself. Um, and you can see how Outright has done this for 30 years um, uh, in terms of their research and leading to an emergency fund. Just a quick question to throw out there. What other ways can we use data to help solve the, uh, I would say, iniqu iniquity gap or the, the lack of equity for LGBT communities out there? Any thoughts on that? Or an example of how that's been done in the past? Maybe Lucerne, I can offer just one quick perspective on this. Sure. It's very economic in nature, but um, you know, on the point of data and understanding uh, where businesses in particular are spending their money, I think there's a lot to be said for um, supplier diversity programs. Now, I think we see this particularly in the US growing a little bit in Europe, but less so in other countries where of course we might often have quite significant suppliers. 
in the US in particular for Microsoft, Microsoft's procurement team, they run a diversity program, which has a, an annual spend of around $3 billion, that's billion with a B, uh, with diverse owned businesses. Uh, and that puts the company in the top 20 of companies uh, with diversity spending globally. How to do that in the US, we work with the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, or the NGLCC for short, to help identify LGBTQI owned businesses in the US and then procurement can take steps uh, to ensure that there is uh, targeted spending with those businesses as well as other diversity owned businesses as well. And I think that uh, if there are uh, similar groups around the world, similar chambers of commerce who can really help businesses with significant global spends like Microsoft and others represented here and beyond to identify where those diversity owned businesses are, whether they're LGBTI owned businesses or otherwise, that can be an important way to really help channel the significant spend that we have and therefore build the uh, economic resilience of those businesses, some, some of which can be very small in nature. I love that. And, and supplier diversity is such a huge, um, I mean, it, it, in terms of impacting um, a society and really giving those who are living in either marginalized or a part of an underrepresented um, group, the ability, the capability, empowering them to help themselves this is one of the major ways that this can happen. So it's such, it's such a great um, insight and comment. Um, we are going to stick with you, Michael, and, and move on to this next question, which is having heard kind of our three areas from the UN perspective, talking about corporations and talking about civil society, um, as we look at taking collective action between companies um, to ensure that we're building back our LGBT, um, LGBT communities um, in a way that's equitable. What does the corporate sector need to do um, with partners like the UN and other LGBTIQ organizations to advance this work? And do you have any examples coming from Microsoft? Sure, and it's a great question. So thank you for posing it, Lutzen. And perhaps I can begin by shining a light on uh, how we work with some partner organizations to advance LGBTQI plus resilience. Um, firstly, I think it's important to recognize that partner organizations really help us to have an on the ground awareness of the challenges faced by LGBTQI people. Uh, for example, if new punitive legislation is being considered or if there is a worsening trend for social discrimination, it is far better if partner organizations can help to increase our awareness long before an issue becomes a front page story, or even more importantly, to help increase our awareness of issues which are never on the front page. Secondly, these partner organizations uh, can also be incredibly helpful in uh, assisting us to have on the ground awareness of opportunities for us to engage. For example, that can include joining corporate statements in support of marriage equality, as we have done in a number of countries, including Taiwan, Japan, the Czech Republic, and elsewhere, as well as having opportunities to uh, convene businesses in Kenya uh, for ongoing roundtable discussions and joint actions as we have been doing in partnership with the Open for Business organization. And as is increasingly needed to speak up and take action uh, in the face of the growing persecution of trans people, just as Michael outlined at the start of this session. So that's some of the ways in which we work with organizations, but maybe I'll just mention two uh, in particular who we work with a lot, uh, and some of the discrete public, uh, discrete and public activities we participate in. And I'll mention just two great organizations by chance. Uh, they happen to be the two who organized today's call, Outright Action International and the Partnership Global LGBTI Equality. Uh, I'd like to give a big shout out to some of their most important successes in terms of outright, Lutzen, you touched upon this, but I do think we need to spend a moment Reflecting on this, I really do think that Outright's most important work ever occurred last year when very early in the pandemic, uh, they launched and now managed the COVID-19 Global LGBT, uh, LGBTIQ uh, Emergency Fund. And that fund has provided uh, millions of dollars to thousands of recipients around the world. Uh, the fund really matters. As we know, as Melisandre mentioned, uh, the health, social and economic inequality experienced by minority groups is being exacerbated quite significantly by COVID. And in many countries, uh, the rebound from the economic shock won't happen until 2023 or 2024. And LGBTQI plus people in low and middle income countries are some of the most uh, impacted, the more likely to work in the informal economy uh, where there is limited or zero job security, and the more likely to work in jobs that are particularly vulnerable to the economic impacts of this pandemic. And again and again, Outright has heard from some of the funds recipients how the micro grants have actually saved their life. And that's incredibly important work. In terms of PGLE, 
uh, Mel Sandry did a great job of uh, just talking about uh, the, the background and the work of that organization. I think one important point to note is that uh, over 300 companies around the world have committed themselves to implement the framework of this business. And that is feasibly the fastest adoption of any corporate human rights standard uh, at, at all. And that's an uh, incredibly uh, important achievement of PGLE, but also I think speaks to the growing interest and appetite of companies to engage on these issues. In terms of where we can probably go next, there are two topics that stand out. One is, I think, conversion therapy. Uh, those companies who are really at the forefront of pushing for uh, equality, I think have an opportunity, maybe even a responsibility to keep pushing equality further, including into issues and areas where uh, there's not yet much engagement by the private sector. Uh, I mentioned marriage equality, that is incredibly important and thankfully over time has become a, a relatively common issue for businesses to engage on, but it is also a little bit like low hanging fruit for some companies now. What's not low hanging fruit, however, is conversion therapy, which still exists in many countries and including countries where we uh, operate as businesses and in which uh, this is literal torture and is absolutely antithetical to the rights of LGBTQI plus people, especially young LGBTQI plus people. Um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to create the norms and platforms for companies to speak out against conversion therapy and to empower our government affairs teams to speak out against this with legislators and importantly to ensure we aren't doing businesses in aren't doing business in ways which facilitates or enables conversion therapy. I'll end by just mentioning one other opportunity again on the topic of supply chains, specifically labor rights and supply chains. Uh, I mentioned how LGBTQI plus people uh, in low and middle income countries can be overrepresented in the informal economy. It can be really hard for companies like Microsoft and other large companies to reach them, but we do have a more immediate connection with LGBTQI plus people in global supply chains. Uh, there's an estimated 450 million people who work in global supply chains. Assuming 5% of them are LGBTQI+, that's about 22 and a half million people, uh, which is not far off the population of Australia. It's pretty significant. As Human Rights Watch reported uh, just a few months ago, workers in global supply chains are now facing uh, reduced income or, or higher job losses as a result of the pandemic. And we know that those impacts will be magnified uh, on LGBTQI plus workers. And uh, you know, just recognizing the increased challenges faced by those workers in global supply chains and recognizing the increased number of companies who have made great progress in labor rights and supply chains, uh, including, for example, in the context of women's empowerment, uh, which BSR, the Business for Social Responsibility, has done tremendous work on, and recognizing that there has been a lot of work done, well, that there has not been much work done on UN standard of conduct number four, which specifically focuses on suppliers. I think there is tremendous opportunity to better spell out and create collective action uh, on respect for LGBTQI plus people in global supply chains. For example, by taking the lessons from the, the HER project led by BSR, which I mentioned, uh, which has done tremendous work in seeking to increase women's empowerment and economic participation in supply chains. I think you can literally just copy and paste that model and apply it for LGBTQI plus people and hopefully see a lot of impact. And hopefully that's something which PGLE and others can work on in the not too distant future. Awesome, very good. And I just wanna throw it out to the rest to see if there's anyone else as well who has additional thoughts or areas of focus even. Um, we heard a few of them. I'm, I'm curious to know if there's any other kind of top of mind um, target areas I'd say for filling in the gaps when it comes to um, human rights for LGBTIQ people or um, thoughts that you, you're, you're hearing out there. That's so absurd. Uh, sitting in the Ethics and Compliance Office, I think going back to what Kanita said, it's hearing those that speak up. You know, the cornerstone of any human rights program is engaging with those impacted. You know, you cannot sit in a corporation and think you know best for everybody. You have to actually engage, engage those who are being impacted and ask them, what do you want? What would look like help to you? Because it will differ depending on who you ask. So, I think it's making sure you have an active process of enabling, whether it's civil society or an individual, enabling them to speak up where they feel safe and they know that they're heard and that something will get done. And that's the one thing that I think sometimes isn't connected in companies is their speak up or their hotline and the work to support LGBT equality. So it's connecting. So if you're going to talk to your legal colleagues, talk to your ethics and compliance colleagues too. You need to make sure people understand the importance of speaking up and to listening when someone does speak up. Because one, just one voice means that just one person was brave enough to say something. 
and that person needs to be heard and action needs to be taken so that you know you can then affect the lives of, of many more who weren't able to speak up so i i just going just kanita just just wrong in my head it's just so important what she said is I appreciate she wants to be kind, but sometimes even being kind to corporations, you can't be. Um, and I'm okay with you just saying how it is and saying what you need and where you need the help, because sometimes we just don't know until someone raises their hand. So, you know, I, I would say if anyone on the lines and companies, please make sure that you have an appropriate hotline mechanism and you have an appropriate way for people to be able to speak up and to make sure that they're being valued and respected at their job, but then also, as Michael mentioned, in the extended supply chain. Awesome. And there was, go ahead, Kanita, I see you come offline. Yeah, I think there's just one more thing that we also need corporate to also know that you have an economic power in every state, in every country that you're located. And it's not a case where we're asking you to hold governments at hostage but you can also create spaces there to have those conversations. Because when we think about economics, we think about development. Um, we think about um, providing um, jobs and creating jobs. Governments are always willing to listen. Let's look at how we can actually help better the policies that actually guide the country through those forums. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, one of the things that I remember that was held under the Obama um, administration in the US was actually a corporate forum looking at human rights and how to, to, to um, better policies. Um, although it was not continued, but this was one of the things that actually gave um, many corporates to rethink how they actually exist. And I'm, I'm particularly pulling on this one because as you have authorized dealers, Microsoft may not be in Sinusha, for example, but there's an authorized deal of Microsoft. Um, and this is by extension, a part of you. Um, how do we keep those accountable or policies at the same level of what you would expect from your own corporation if they are working on your behalf? Um, how do we also, if you're having a meeting with government, for example, or with certain high level persons, how do you invite someone, for example, like outright to share a little about your partnership? I know it's about money, but it's also about money when you think about civil society, because it's about that impact. And I could tell you from an island which is highly dependent on tourism, COVID flatlined this for us in this, in, this, in this last year. And so every hotel was pretty much closed for a period of time. Airlines were grounded. You know, when you deal with islands that tourism is its main, its main function, it's, its currency import, you then understand how bad things turn for that country. And that's almost all the small islands in the Caribbean that have tourism as their main, their main dollar. So we certainly understand the impact of COVID, but also of any natural disaster, because if the hurricane pass, if too much rain falls over our islands, we are flooded. In addition to that, St. Vincent just had the La, the La Soufre volcano erupted. But you know what? It was not just St. Vincent affected. Because of the winds, Senusha was covered with ash. Barbados was covered with ash, you know? So again, looking at the impact of climate change and how your companies also contribute to that is still, is also another thing. So whilst we speak about the rights of LGBT and we wanna make sure we also include racial um, justice, we also have to think about climate change and how we are producing, what we are producing and how we're giving back to the environment. So I just wanted to put in that small chunk as we think about, and I really want to leave you with the message of your influence to governments are great. Your partnership with civil society to influence government is even greater. Thank you. All right, very nice. And, and um, I think I heard somebody, yes, go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, so 
Lizard, so what's top of mind for me um, is that um, multinational corporations need to visibly like show their support for LGBT people. We need to know who the allied uh, uh, corporations are, you know, and how they have their, uh, how they have our, our back in that sense. And, you know, we know that, you know, on a worldwide basis, different countries have different legal frameworks and different uh, tolerance towards LGBT people. And there's a lot of diversity and spectrum on that. And th that's diversity, not in a, in a good way. But a lot of MNCs and multinational companies actually adopt three different approaches, right? The framework that we know, which is like, okay, the when in Rome approach, which is, okay, when you're operating in the US, you're you know, saying that you're a LGBT uh, community supporter, but when you're operating in Singapore, which criminalizes uh, same-sex relations between uh, gay men, uh, you take a when in Rome approach and you don't push the envelope on what you could do in a country like Singapore. Um, next level, embassy. The embassy approach is where you uh, have designated your company as a safe haven. So you say that, well, when, when people, you, you protect your employees, you provide special rights to them, and it's a safe haven for LGBT people to, to work when they're working for your organization. And those are the people that you're actually interested in taking care of, and not necessarily outside of the organization that you that you work in. And the third, third approach is the advocacy approach, where you take a more active role in actually trying to push for changes um, wherever you can push for, for changes and wherever, as Kanita said, you can exert your uh, influence. We need more companies to not just be visible, you know, and during pride season, deck out their reception, hand out pride paraphernalia, you know, but really support the LGBT community in a very um, uh, meaningful uh, way, you know, and we need for more multinational companies to actually be moving towards an advocacy approach rather than just staying in when Rome and, and uh, embassy. And I love that Claire is on this panel because oftentimes when we ask for, for a sponsorship, you know, so whether we're, we're the, the local civil society groups are actually asking for sponsorship or we're a regional group that's, that's registered or like our, right, a, a global international group that's, that's registered, on a local basis, the pushback often comes from the legal department and often comes from the government affairs department, you know? So it would be awesome as a follow-up to this, if we could organize some, another event where we gather all of the legal and government affairs people of, support, of companies that have supposedly signed on to the UN standards of conduct that have signed on to PGLE on a global basis, but are actually, un, are actually afraid to take a bolder step on, on a local basis, on a regional basis, to be a more visible ally for the LGBT uh, community. So, um, Claire, I'm gonna hit you up for that um, after I'm this. All, I'll be your first attendee, or first panelist. I'm all on for that, I agree. You'll, you'll, you'll be the keynote speaker, I think. <laughs> Happy to. And so, yeah, that internal wiring is so important. I'll share that at PepsiCo, our, our North America executive sponsor of our equal LGBT ERG is um, head of uh, human rights for uh, for kind of North America, um, and then for globally for our executive sponsor. He actually it sits uh, in, with us in PGLE. He also is the is one of our global government affairs leads, uh, senior vice president of global government affairs. So we're very much trying to wire that in, you know, in the same vein to say, okay, we want to make sure that those who are making these types of decisions have the information or wired in to what's going on in terms of LGBTIQ plus rights. Um, we, before we turn to um, this question, um, which we kind of already covered, I was just curious to know if there are any further additional thoughts because this is great a conversation. I just wanted to make sure that, it, that everyone had a, an opportunity to, to voice their thoughts on, on this last topic. Hi, Lisa. Maybe I can just uh, jump in. Um, it's, a, it's a comment I had in the chat box, but I think you know sometimes on some some topics, an individual company might feel a little unsure about you know speaking out, especially if they're a lone voice in in in, in some countries. But what we've seen is there's a lot of power in partnerships, not you know between companies. Uh, collectively. So I think, you know, collective action by companies on some of these topics, 
you know, um, can be very effective. You know, it's not just an issue for a single company, but you have, you know, five, 10 prominent companies saying, you know, this is an issue for us. This is an issue for, uh, you know, our ability to uh, conduct business. This is an issue for us in terms of, you know, being able to uh, you know, empower our staff to, to work effectively and to work with the community. And that carries a really powerful message, I think, to, to um, government officials, and it provides a platform for, for action. And we've seen, you know, advocacy campaigns that, that really effectively build on, on, on the power of collective action. So I just, I just flagged that as a, as a good practice to, to look at. Um, and it, that really is adaptable to a lot of different contexts. So not just, you know, North America or Europe, but I think in a lot of places that can work and, and take the pressure off of like a, a single company. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. So I'm going to stick with you for a second, Michael, and, and ask you um, this question. You know, June 10th is going to be the 10th anniversary of the UN um, principles and guidelines for business practices, right? And so as we look ahead um, to the future, um, let's say 10 years from now, or maybe not even as we get towards that anniversary and I can't even believe I'm going to say this, 2027, um, what can we expect? What, what can we expect looking ahead? What do we hope the world will be and look like um, in terms of these standards and how businesses conduct themselves? Well, thanks, Luzerne. Uh, and I, I love the, um, you know, the forward-looking question. You know, I think we need to move, and I think this is speaking to Kenita's point, you know, we need to move from the um, uh, ambition to really putting things into practice, right? At the moment, we're still trying to raise awareness of companies, of these standards of conduct, the steps they can take. You know, speaking to Michael's point, you know, we can see that, you know, there's very clear guidance and practice for companies to speak to their suppliers and they are doing it, they are putting it into practice. And it's not just something that is happening in, in North America or, or Western Europe, but it's something that is that companies are taking seriously across their global supply chains. Uh, you know, there are the difficult conversations. So beyond uh, uh, pride and the moment of pride, there are the uncomfortable conversations about, okay, we still have these inequalities. We still have these gaps that are happening in, in offices, in, um, in countries where you operate, what, are, what is your company doing to engage in those public conversations? Uh, also where it is, uh, you know, it can be a bit more challenging. Um, what are you um, dedicating in terms of support to the community? You know, where are the metrics uh, to, um, uh, to, to measure your progress? So beyond the commitments, what are you doing to track, you know, how you're implementing these in your in your organization? So I think there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of action points, and I think there's a lot of goodwill and commitment. But I think in in five to ten years, we really want to see the results coming in and uh, the reporting of those results, so that there's also accountability for 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 these commitments. So I think you know it's. it's um, Looking forward to to seeing that and being to getting back together in in five years and and seeing how that how, how is really uh, coming into into practice. Awesome. Um, I want to. I we did we did see kind of one question and answer come in, so we'll address that and then we'll go towards closing because we're we're getting to time. So. Thank you, Michael. We're gonna to switch to, I think Kanita wants to take a stab at this question. I'll just read it very quickly for everyone. And we did kind of touch on it a bit, um, but it's good to go back because it is such an important point. Um, um, so how do civil societies um, navigate partnerships with multinational corporations and TNCs? How do they identify which MNCs and or TNCs are ethical in their global labor value chain um, because there are reports from this global south that where MNCs and TNCs also exploit the resources of where products 
are made and outsourced. And probably Kanita and maybe Claire can even join in on this as well. Um, again, I guess it's always the idea of doing the homework. Um, and I think one of the things that's probably, um, I would say, um, probably a disadvantage is that um, when some corporations actually um, settle out of, out of court or behind the scenes, some of those things don't get documented. But I think that if civil society um, actually starts making a list, and I mean, there are a few lists out there already um, that actually have um, a look at where different corporations sits on different issues. Um, and if that can actually become more of a global list, then you'll actually see and um, understand where the ethical grounding of each organization is on different issues. Um, I also think that I know it's not a nation, it's not a global act, but um, one of the cases we can probably look at is the fact that when there was this big issue with Oxfam um, from the UK, the UK um, then did what was called the Care Act. And the reason I'm bringing that up because it is looking at the protection of vulnerable people. So unlike we usually look at um, the protection of children, you're actually looking at the protection of people and looking at where um, power might be overused in one way or the other that allows vulnerable people to become more vulnerable. And I'm saying that because when we think about corporations, um, we think about the relationship between Global North and Global South, there's always an element of power that sits with corporation or sit with Global North, regardless of who you're speaking to from Global South. So I think we can actually put policies in place. Um, corporations can look at that policy to ensure they are doing no harm, but civil society can also look at those policies to look at how you actually don't put yourself or the people you work with or represent at um, in further harm's way. Um, and that is one of the things that two things we can do. One is coming from the corporate side in terms of thinking about um, what additional policies can we put to ensure we bring in no harm, but also we protecting ourselves from that situation and how are we and civil society thinking about how do we protect us and community um, from that. It's not black and white. Um, and I think that it's, there is, it, it's definitely not easy um, because many a times you are in a position of, I need to eat, I need to survive against, should I or should I not take this money or do this job? But I think this is where we start having each other's back by creating those global lists that have organizations Say, for example, Microsoft, where you look at the issues on racial, you can look at the issues on LGBT, you can look at on, 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 on climate change, and you can also look at the labor force, where they subside, where they are sending their work to, how do they treat their employees, and so on and so forth. Those things are out there, but they are all in pieces. And I think what's required now is to collate it, bring those lists to one and being able to publish it. Maybe that's something Outright might do for us in the next year. Who knows? Um, with the support of Microsoft. So I, I'm just kind of putting it out there of things of possibilities. Very good. Thank you. All right. So we are unfortunately at the end of our time. Um, we have talked about a lot today, but I am not one to leave the table without some clear action. So I am going to turn my wrap into just a few things that I've heard and maybe those who are listening can take this back to their companies and start to implement them. So step one, UN standards. Let's get those signed. Let's get, the, get those read. Let's get our legal and ethical um, officers in our companies to 
make sure that they, you have recognized this and said, yes, we are about this. That's step one. And then turn those, that, that signature into actions, into your voice, into your statements, into your internal policies, into your downstream supply chain, workforce labor policies, um, and make sure that you are amplifying that voice of equality and equity when it comes to LGBTIQ people. Um, and as you start to think about what that voice is, you have a few options that have been laid out here today, conversion therapy, focus, marriage equality, a focus, anti-trans legislation around the world can be a focus, labor rights can be a focus, um, and also jobs, creating jobs, uh, holding jobs that are really going to be appealing to attracting or you know creating space for LGBTIQ people so that um, LGBTIQ people around the world can provide for themselves. Um, second is join PGLE. If you have not done so, this is an opportunity to really cement those partnerships. It gives you access to really great civil societies that have this information. So PGLE has been a great way for companies to really understand and work with civil societies um, and to build back better um, and, and more equitably. And then thirdly is to donate to Outright, uh, inter uh, Outright International's Emergency Fund. So this is action that you can take today, right? And by doing that, you are actually contributing, putting your, as we say, money where your mouth is, right? going out there, putting your money out there and knowing that it's going to hit home, that it's going to go to an organization that's really focused on and going to make a difference for members um, of various LGBTI communities around the world. So hopefully you've taken something away from that. I certainly have. I wanna thank all of our fantastic panelists for joining us today. Um, I wanna wish you all a very, very happy Pride. Um, and a fantastic rest of the month. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.